Welcome to Industry Focus, the show that dives into a different sector of the stock market every day. Today is Wednesday, November the 28th, and we're talking healthcare. I'm your host, Shannon Jones, and I am joined via Skype by healthcare specialist and all around good guy, Todd Campbell. Todd, how are you? I'm doing great. I think I'm finally, Shannon, uh, recovering from Pie Fest 2018, <laughs> the post Turkey Day festivities. They took a toll on me, but I think I'm coming out the other side all right. But it was so worth it, wasn't it, Todd? Oh, it's absolutely <laughs> worth it. And in and the three days afterwards of uh, of sandwiches, oh man, lots Woo. of turkey sandwiches. That's for sure. I've I've literally been in the gym every day since I've gotten back into town. So I'm trying to work off at least the five or six pounds I put on just from <laughs> the few days we were yeah. out. <laughs> trying to figure out how it took me a year to lose five or six pounds going <laughs> exactly. to the gym and <laughs> one weekend to gain it all back. But you know. Such it is, is what life. it is. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I'm really excited uh, about today's show. Um, and so, for our listeners, we're actually going to be diving into our top healthcare picks. And I'm excited for a couple of reasons. One, because Todd, it was actually hard for me to decide my top picks, especially with the stock market being down, because so many now are at such attractive prices. Did you find that too when you're trying to decide which stocks am I going to choose? Yeah, you know, I was I was actually looking at my portfolio, and probably like a lot of our listeners, um, many names in my portfolio fell a lot more than the broader market, and I think offer some really nice opportunity here. But I, I think what I finally settled to do, and I don't know if this is the approach you took or, or not, Shannon, but I, what I finally decided to do is to say, you know what, I'm not going to look at my own portfolio names right now. Instead, what I'm going to do is highlight a couple stocks. That are on sale right now that I have on my watch list, and that could be attractive buys now. Um, so that's that's the approach I took to try yeah. and whittle it down. But you're right; there are so many, so many opportunities because listeners, unless you've been in a post Turkey Day <laughs> food coma, hate to break the bad news to you, but the stock market has been sliding. We're in correction territory with a drop of about ten uh, percent at the low uh, since September. And certainly, healthcare definitely not immune to that, Todd. Oftentimes, you'll see healthcare uh, take the biggest swings when the market is in a downturn. And yes, just like you, I was like, I'm not going to look at any of the stocks that I own. Uh, I'm actually going to kind of go outside. There's some stocks that fools around uh, HQ have been talking about. And I was like, now may be a really good time to start diving into them. So I'm excited to to talk about that. Um, certainly, on the biotech end of healthcare, there is always a good batch of beat down biotechs, which we'll get to. But what I'm hoping our listeners will get today is really a wide range of different types of stocks that hopefully appeal to many different types of investors, too. Right. And just to set the stage a little bit, Shen, you know, I looked at the <clears throat> healthcare ETFs that I like to follow to kind of get a gauge of how the how the sectors and industries in healthcare are doing. One of them is the XLV. Um, and you know, I noticed that that's down still about four percent from its peak in September and early October. At one point, it was down eight point three percent, so it's bounced back a little bit. And the biotech index, the ETF that I like to follow, is the IBB, I boy boy, um, and that's still down fourteen percent from its uh, late September, early October peak. Uh, it got down, you know, as much as sixteen percent. And you know, as I mentioned at the early or the top of the show. Um, a lot of those individual stocks are down much more than that. And the two stocks I want to highlight today, uh, both of them are down more than 20%. Yeah, let's dive into your first one, Todd. Um, this would be a stock that um, I know one of our fellow colleagues, Brian Feroldi, has talked quite a bit about. But tell us about your first top healthcare pick. Well, we've talked on the show a lot about, uh, in the past, diabetes and what a major market opportunity uh, that is for for investors. And one of the companies that I want to highlight today is Insulet. And Insulet goes by the symbol P O D D. And they make a small saucer shaped um, insulin pump that people can, diabetics can wear for up to three days. And it's the only tubeless pump that's on the market. They were trading about $106 at the peak in September and October. They're down about 24% from that, trading around 81 today. Yeah, and certainly it sounds like insulin shares could go lower. But one of the things um, in researching for this episode, uh, I'm impressed with the fact that obviously the diabetes market is huge, but they've got a d drug delivery system that could even expand beyond diabetes as well. 
Well, you know, it's really interesting to watch and see how companies are starting to try and reach out and, and revolutionize diabetes treatment with these different devices that basically allow patients to have a much easier time in figuring out when they need to take their insulin and then automating the delivery of that insulin so that patients no longer have to go through this process of multiple finger sticks a day to see if they need to have those insulin injections. And then, of course, taking those actual injections afterwards. There are 30 million people in the U.S. with diabetes, including one and a half million people, roughly, with type 1 diabetes, which is the form of diabetes in which uh, those patients don't produce any insulin. And those patients have a very high burden um, as far as having to do these finger sticks and, and take these multiple injections every day. So these companies like Insulate have come out and developed um, different devices that can be used in combination with one another to try and make that whole process simpler, easier, and more effective. Because studies have shown that the typical di diabetic is going to spend about 70% of their day outside of their targeted blood sugar range. And that is bad news because it can contribute <clears throat> to the disease progressing more quickly, um, causing kidney, da kidney damage, um, nerve damage, uh, cardiovascular damage. So, insulate has got this Omnipod, which is this you know, insulin delivery device that can be worn. It's the only tubeless one that's on the market. And it is positioned to benefit from the fact that, you know, we've got this huge and growing population of diabetes patients. I think um, the Institute for Alternative Futures estimates that we could go from 30 million Americans to 55 million Americans with diabetes by 2030. So there's a huge demographic tailwind supporting uh, demand for this company. And just to just speaking about the convenience and advantages of pumps themselves, I mean, it certainly makes sense when you can automate this insulin delivery. But this is certainly this certainly doesn't mean that insulin is in a field all by itself because it's definitely got some competition. Is that right? Yeah, and it's got I mean, one of those competitors is very deep pocketed. It's Medtronic, symbol MDT. Um, they have a a big diabetes business. And they produce, not only do they produce insulin pumps that compete against um, uh, the Omnipod, they also produce continuous glucose monitors that are used to evaluate your blood sugar uh, in real time. They have launched, they were the first actually to launch an automated insulin delivery system that marries their um, continuous glucose monitor and their pump together. Since then, another competitor, Tandem Diabetes, rolled out their own automated system uh, in combination with a continuous glucose monitor made by Dexcom earlier this year. I think it was in August that they began selling that. So there is stiff competition, and Insulate does not have an automated system on the market yet. So, you know, investors should realize that, okay, they could face some headwinds to their growth rate um, as you know people decide whether or not they want to have these automated automated systems rather than the convenience of the tubeless pump um, itself. That being said, though, this don't count insulate out because they're working on their own automated system should be in the market by 2020. And the way that they're designing their system is not only to use Dexcom's CGM, but to be able to use a smartphone app. To control it, which would be just be really, really something that a lot of patients would like to see. Um, really, really big jump up in convenience. And you know what, Shannon? Even with all this con competition from Medtronic and Tandem, this is still a company that's growing double digits. Yeah, I was just looking here. 2017 sales grew 26% to $460 million. Um, and just in Q3, sales grew 24% year over year to $151 million. Uh, for the full year, looks like guiding for $558 to $563 million in sales. And that's up about 20% from last year. And it sounds like they're pretty close to turning a corner on profitability as well. Is that right? Absolutely. This, if they were on track to deliver their first uh, operating profit in since their inception this year, and you know they've done a great job of controlling their expenses, boosting their gross margin, and I think that you know yes, in the short term they're going to still face some some competitive headwinds from Medtronic and Tandem, but the fact that they're still growing so quickly, even in the face of those those stiff competitors, 
And then, you know, the fact that they have that own, their own automated system coming in a year, year and a half. I, I think that this is an attractive stock to add to long term portfolios. Could be bumpy for a little while, but I think long term portfolios. Um, adding this one would make sense. Absolutely. And to that point, I think uh, watching the partnership opportunities that'll come about. So, right now, um, Insulid is partnered with Amgen on the delivery system for New Lasta. You could certainly see many different applications across the entire healthcare space where this Omnipod, like the customized version of the Omnipod, can be used to deliver different types of medication to different patients. I think this is actually... Um, of the ones we've looked at, this one has actually probably caught my attention the most, Todd. I think it's a very intriguing play, and it, you know, part of the reason that I think it's such an intriguing play is because of the of the fact that it is, you know, has a potential to be a major disruptive force in the treatment of what is a huge, multiple hundreds of billions of dollars a year in spending market. Um, I also like, you know, Dexcom, which we talked about it being the continuous glucose Mars. They're an agnostic play because you know you could use a tandem pump, you can use an insulin pump with them, whatever. Um, but I, I think the insulin offers a, a particularly interest, interesting value right now, if you will, uh, because of that 20% drop. Absolutely. So let's turn our attention to your second stock, Todd. And uh, I think one of the themes that I have recognized from our uh, most recent shows, and even with this one, as we were identifying these stocks, is that the aging baby boomer population is a massive, massive opportunity for investors to get in on just growth opportunities, not just on the drug side, but also too on the health care insurance side as well. Yeah, I mean, you talk about a huge market. 10,000 baby boomers per day uh, turning 65, a longer living population. That's significant because it means demand uh, for healthcare services by the elderly is increasing. And that should put a company like WellCare Health, symbol WCG, in a great position to profit from its Medicaid and Medicare insurance business. Yeah, so it looks like here, um, WellCare plays a huge part in the marketplace for insurance, primarily Medicaid and Medicare. And really, it's been interesting watching this particular stock, especially coming off of the midterm elections, because now that we have the Democrats in the House, things have certainly changed for this company. Yeah, which is interesting because you know the last two years um, after Trump was elected, and of course the the Republicans had control of both the House and the Senate. Uh, there was a te- there was an attempt to eliminate Obamacare, and Obamacare includes a provision that expanded Medicaid. Now states didn't have to opt into Medicaid expansion, but many of them did. So, so one of the fears over the last two years was that if Obamacare was rolled back, then what would happen with Medicaid expansion? And one of the things that investors have to recognize is that what happens with these insurers is that they go out and they bid on a per member basis. So the more people who are enrolled in Medicaid programs, the more money they make in premiums. So Medicaid expansion has been a huge win for companies like WellCare Health. And the threat of that getting rolled back obviously was something that you know was on the minds of investors. Now that uh, the Democrats took over control of the House. The likelihood, I think, of any kind of a real repeal or replace that, that jeopardizes Medicaid expansion is is extreme. Has become de risk. It's it's low to non existent in my view, um, and I think that that you know provides an interesting, I guess, tailwind, if you will, or backdrop backstop to uh, well care health stock price, which over the last you know six to eight weeks has tumbled about twenty five percent. And it's not just Medicaid, but it's also Medicare too. Um, And also too, it sounds like this company is pretty um, pretty aggressive when it comes to acquisitions as well. So it's got multiple areas that it's targeting and really strategically focusing on. Yeah, I mean they get most of their sales from the Medicaid side of things. Three point two billion in revenue from Medicaid in the third quarter. That represented about sixty four percent of their total revenue of five point one billion. So they're still predominantly. Um, a Medicaid insurer. Uh, they have been going out and bidding in new states. They won um, 
uh, new bids. They won contracts in Florida and Arizona. They also went out and they bought a competitor called Meridian. All of those things are, are going to increase and drive revenue higher on the Medicaid side of things in 2019. And then on the Medicare side of things, they're also selling Medicare Advantage businesses. So they're targeting all those people who are turning 65 and are looking at it, trying to figure out do I want to stay with regular Medicare? Uh, traditional Medicare, or do I want to go with a Medicare Advantage plan? And because you know, traditional Medicare doesn't have out-of-pocket limits on what the patient will have to pay. Um, many people are choosing these Medicare Advantage plans, and as a result, its Medicare revenue is growing. They did 1.6 billion in Medicare revenue in the third quarter, and that was up from 1.47 billion the year before, and that's because they're getting more and more members to sign up for their Medicare Advantage plans. And it also sounds like WellCare is also uh, upping their full year guidance for 2018 as well. So it sounds like they're growing not just on the acquisition front, but also organically as well. What can you tell us about that, Todd? Well, you know, the revenue was up year over year 15%, as I mentioned. They're a profitable company. They do look at their medical cost ratio, MCR ratio, um, is somewhere in the mid 80s. You know, so so they, they do a good job as far as managing their risk in that way. Um, they also have a nice little tailwind coming um, soon because they agreed to buy Aetna's Part T business uh, in September. And, and as listeners may remember, Aetna has agreed to combine with CVS, but to get approval for that combination from the Department of Justice, Aetna had to get rid of its Part D um, you know, revenue. So, what ended up happening is WellCare went out and bought it. <laughs> so, that's go- they're going to get about an additional $1.5 billion in revenue tailwinds, uh, assuming you know, all the members stick around, uh, once they officially have taken that over. And I think we'll probably see most of that revenue show up in 2020. So, it may not be in a 2019 thing, but in 2020. So, you've got you know, the advantage of the Medicaid expansion in Florida and Arizona, organic growth, Medicare Advantage growth, and then the potential tailwind, obviously, from buying the Part that could help support uh, growth in, in two years rather than in the next 12 months. Yeah, so lots of opportunities for well care there. Um, let's turn our attention over to uh, the two stocks I pulled out um, from the market. And the first one is actually a type of equity that, Todd, you and I don't talk about a whole lot, but I certainly think uh, this one has its place. And that is a healthcare real estate pick, specifically a company called HCP Inc. It is what is known as a REIT or a real estate investment trust. Um, and so often, Oftentimes, many of our listeners aren't familiar with what a REIT is. So, just to give you an overview, um, traditionally, most of us, myself included, just can't go out and buy real estate um, at will. But what we can do is pull our resources together as investors and then actually buy a collection of properties or real estate assets. And that's exactly what REITs do. Uh, REITs also have a very special tax. Status, which basically requires them to pay out at least 90% of their income as dividends. And if they do, they just aren't taxed at the corporate level like most other businesses. Um, So, the business model for an equity REIT in particular, which is what we're talking about, not a mortgage REIT, which you certainly want to stay away from, but from an equity REIT perspective, um, they buy properties, lease those properties to tenants. This provides a nice steady stream of income, most of which is then passed to us, the shareholders. What's really interesting about these um, these REITs is is the fact that you know you look at other REITs like mall operators, right, and how e-commerce is is causing places like Sears to 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 abandon stores, and those mall operators are under pressure, right? Well, you don't necessarily. I'm not going to say you you wouldn't have closures or high vacancy rates with um, healthcare REITs like this, but I think it's less likely because you know. Healthcare is relatively inelastic to the economic cycle. You know, if you need healthcare, you're going to go out and seek healthcare. And right now, there's a, a tremendous amount of money that's sloshing around um, in in drug development and and just a specialists, you name it, in providing care to all those baby boomers. And as a result, that's leading to these companies having you know pretty stable and high um, occupancy rates. Absolutely. And just to put some stats behind that, right now, $1.1 trillion worth of healthcare real estate is in existence, but only 15% of this is actually REIT 
owned. Compare that to commercial real estate, like you were mentioning, Todd, like retail shopping centers, malls, even hotels. That's about 40% REIT owned. So I feel like the opportunity is certainly massive for healthcare REITs. You mentioned the aging baby boomer population. Uh, we know that's going to be a massive growth opportunity in the healthcare space. You also mentioned the economy as well. If things start to turn south, generally healthcare expenses are one of the last to go. Um, and also, too, we talked about it on last week's show uh, with our telemedicine, uh, telehealth show. Um, you see insurers and payers favoring a lot more of these off-site, uh, lower-cost facilities. And that's really what a lot of these really strong REITs are going after, are these assets that are not hospital-based, but they are separate, standalone facilities. And so, that's why I think healthcare REITs, in particular, make such a compelling investment. Um, and so, HCP has been a uh, an interesting uh, equity to follow for a number of reasons. And I'd say number one is that it's truly a turnaround story if there is ever one. Um, if you even go back to 2016, this particular stock um, was down. Uh, I have to go back and look at the numbers, but I want to say it was down almost 40% at one point. Um, and a lot of that was because of his exposure to skilled nursing facilities. Skilled nursing facilities are basically long term care for patients who have difficulty doing like regular day to day activities. Um, Back then, HCP, their portfolio was heavily concentrated in these skilled nursing facilities. I think in 2016, it was about 26% or so. They've actually now diversified their real estate portfolio to move away from those skilled nursing facilities. And the reason is because those facilities are much more dependent on government reimbursement. Now they are much more focused on private payers, which provides a much steadier stream of income and also to just allows for a much more diversified base. Right. And you're allowed to put those contracts in, have built in escalators and those type of things that can help offset some of your rising costs. You know, I think one of the concerns that some people have had um, lately is that in a rising interest rate environment, some dividend stocks look less attractive because now you can go out and you can buy <clears throat> short term bonds and get relatively competitive yields to what the S&P 500 may be yielding, especially if rates continue to climb over the course of the next year. Um, and that's kind of made it, I guess, some of these higher dividend paying stocks um, more attractive because okay, well, if I if I'm only can only earn less than two percent on on the S and P, why would I want to take on that risk? I can go out and I can buy this short term bond instead with less risk. Well, now if you're talking about a higher dividend than that, then it becomes a little bit more compelling. Absolutely. So right now their dividend, I believe they're right at about a five percent yield, which is uh, pretty impressive, especially for those that are looking for a steady stream of income. Uh, the shares are trading for about twenty nine dollars a share. Um, you did see in January and February of this year, most REITs going back to the interest rate sensitivity. Most REITs did take a hit as the Feds continued to raise rates. Um, what's been interesting though is with HCP in particular, um, they have been able to not only recover those losses, but are actually doing quite well. Um, even after the fact they took a tumble in October, um, they are at $29 a share, up about 40% from its lows from January and February. Um, and this really does go against conventional wisdom with REITs, where the mantra truly is stay away when the Fed interest rates are at play. Um, so, this stock has a lot to offer in terms of long-term growth. Um, I would also add, to um, there were some management missteps along the way that I think got them into a portfolio that was so heavily concentrated in an area that was declining. Um, but they've been able to spin off assets. Uh, they sp spun off their skilled nursing assets into a newly created REIT, actually called QCP. They did sell a substantial amount of uh, its Brookdale-occupied properties, transitioned 35 others to new operators. Um, and also just exited several other non-core investments. So strategically, now this company is just much more in line to have predictable revenue streams. Now a much more diversified and focused company, and it's got three core areas: senior housing, it's got life science properties, and medical offices. And those are going to be those areas that I mentioned are much less reliant on government reimbursement, but also too are really kind of the core areas that you see the industry transitioning to as. Well, yeah, and I think that those properties become are are increasingly valuable. Um, you know, you figure you have to sometimes they have to be built out specifically with with you know 
things like ventilation, certain ventilation, et cetera, et cetera, that uh, kind of creates a stickiness, if you will, with the uh, people who are renting those spaces from you. Um, so, I mean, I think obviously in, in the future, you got to keep an eye on things like what's going on with um, the National Institute of Health's uh, funding budgets and, and how much money is going into research. You got to keep an eye on how much money is going to venture capital um, that's allowing some of these university researchers to spin off and create their own new businesses. Those kind of things will also um, will, will play a role in determining you know vacancy rates in the future. But for now, like you said, I mean, it's. I think that this company is doing a pretty good job in in getting itself back on track. Yep, and not only that, the balance sheet is also improving. Um, HCP is now has basically been paying down a lot of its debt. Its net debt to adjusted EBITDA has dropped from six and a half times to six times on a pro forma basis. This actually led to an improved credit rating um, from the S and P recently as well. And so that's just freed up a lot more cash for them to go after a lot of these strategic moves um, and go into those more lucrative assets. So definitely one to watch. I do think, um, like the other company, this will be a bumpy road ahead. We're still in a rising rate environment. I think the Feds are expected to raise rates in 2019 at least three more times um, from what I've heard. So still in transformation phase, still has a long way to go. But I think this company is certainly one to watch. So. Turning our attention to the last stock, um, this has been uh, one of my favorites, and it's rare, Todd, to have a large cap biotech player go on sale. And one of my favorites is Celgene. Of course, that sticker symbol C E L G. Um, and just like many biotechs, many large cap biotech. Companies right now, um, many of them are ridiculously cheap. So, Celgene is actually down 33% on the year uh, for some reasons are, which are very much warranted. <laughs> it's currently sitting at $69 <laughs> a share, but it's lost half of its value since about a year ago, a little over a year ago. So, it's trading at about seven times forward earnings. But when you compare that to the other major players, you're looking at 11 times for Biogen, nine times for Gilead, and 13 times. For Amgen, it actually makes Celgene look that much more attractive. Yeah, and you know, listeners, if you own Celgene and you've suffered through that loss, I feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Shannon, this is a core holding in the healthcare portion of my own personal portfolio, so I've been riding this one lower. Um, it is a long-term holding for me, and I agree with you that you know it's rare to see a company. And I'm going to take this one step further. It's rare to see a company that's growing by double digits, right? That is trading at such a discount. Um, versus where it was a year ago. And you said there are some good reasons for that. <laughs> but I think that those reasons are pretty temporary. I don't know if you agree. I totally agree. So, just digging into that, um, a little over a year ago, they had the big phase three disastrous failure for GD301, uh, which certainly took a huge hit to the stock. Um, I think even worse, and I think probably more embarrassing for the company, was the refuse to file a notice that they received from the FDA for really one of the most widely watched, most anticipated assets, and that was Ozanamod for multiple sclerosis. For our listeners who aren't aware, it's one thing to get a complete response letter where the FDA just says, no, we're not going to approve this, even after we've reviewed the application. It's a whole nother thing when the FDA says, I'm not even going to look at this because it's not complete. I mean, Todd, this is something you expect from like a a rookie biotech that just sprung off the side of the streets of San Francisco, right? <laughs> Certainly not a company that you know has four blockbuster <laughs> drugs on the market. You would not expect to have that. I think they moved fast. I mean, it was an acquisition. They spent billions of dollars on it a few years ago when they bought Recepta. I think it was Receptos. Yes, uh, to get Ozanamod. And you know, I think that they were just they moved too quick. So now they're going back. They're look, going through everything. They're trying to get all their ducks in a, in a row. And I think they plan on refiling that early next year. But I think you're right that that was. That was uh, that was egg on the face for Celgene, <laughs> no question. And it certainly doesn't stop there. I think um, to to bring it more 
in terms of what's happening now and what the concerns are moving forward, it really comes down to Revlimid. Right now, Revlimid makes up about 63% of Celgene's revenue, so a, a huge moneymaker for the company, but they are going to be facing generic competition as soon as 2022, and there are multiple generic competitors. They were able to actually kind of stave off Natco Pharma um, a couple of years ago, where basically they structured an agreement where uh, Natco would basically limit its volume, which basically means that they have no incentive to offer discounts, which is great for Celgene. Um, but now you've got companies like Mylan, you've also got um, Dr. Reddy's Laboratories that are going to have generics. So I, I'm hopeful. I'll put cautiously optimistic that they'll be able to structure similar agreements with these companies, but that is a huge cloud hanging over Celgene right now. I think that you know we have to put that a little bit in perspective. Um, I, I thought that we would see you know the the these brand name drugs lose a lot more of their market share early on uh, the biologics once uh, biosimilars were approved uh, than they have. And and I think what you're seeing is just these companies are getting increasingly smarter in figuring out ways to to control. Uh, the decline so that it's a slower pace than maybe you would otherwise expect. And I think that that's going to buy Celgene some important time. One of the things that I think is you're probably going to hit on in a second, um, but one of the things I think is interesting about talking about Celgene today is that you know they've got some big news potentially coming very soon at Ash. Uh, and one of those news items that's going to be coming on Ash is going at Ash is going to be insight into what could become a successor drug to Revlimid, BB two one two one B one BB two one two one seven, which is the second uh, generation version of those CAR Ts for multiple myeloma. Yeah, so ASH is actually coming up next week. For our listeners who aren't familiar, it's the American Society of Hematology. Um, it is a huge, huge conference. Both scientists and investors and companies come and present data. Um, Bluebird, who Celgene is partnered with on BB2121, will be presenting data. So all eyes will definitely be on that. Um, but to your point, Todd, I mean, Granted, they've got a lot of things right now that have been working against them, but for things that I think could work in their favor, they're looking to launch at least five new drugs over the next couple of years, potentially BB2121 and the others, but also, too, of course, azanamide, as we've talked about, they're actually expecting to submit for U.S. and European approvals um, in the first quarter of 2019 after the delay with the RTF. That's a drug that could reach a billion dollars annually just on the MS indication. Like many MS drugs, you also see them um, also go for the GI indications like ulcer ulcerative colitis. Um, that could be another big money maker. They've also got <clears throat> Fedredmib. Uh, Celgene plans to file for U.S. approval of blood disease drug Fedredmib in treating myelofibrosis by the end of this year um, for European submission. And if it wins, this drug could compete against uh, Insight's billion dollar blockbuster. Jacophy as well. Um, they've got really a number of different drugs in the pipeline. Uh, Loose Patership is another drug on the blood disorder spectrum. This is partnered with Acceleron Pharma. Celgene thinks it could have two billion in peak cells there. And then um, we talked a little bit about on the cell therapy side, but they've also got Lysocell, that's the company's gene therapy for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, too. So you've got really a rich pipeline. Evaluate Pharma actually has it as the number three best pipeline in the entire industry. This could more than make up for any decline that we may see on Revlimid sales. I totally agree. That's one of the reasons that I'm so confident I'm holding on to this as a core holding. Um, obviously, like we said at the top top of the segment, you know, we've taken it on the chin, investors, with our Celgene <laughs> shares. Um, but yeah, they've got a lot of irons in the fire, and a lot of these could be very large drugs. You talked about them. I mean, these are multi. Uh, these are these are blockbusters in the making potentially. Okay, so yeah, we still obviously have to get those filings done. We and, and have them go smoothly, right? And we have to have the FDA weigh in with approvals on these things. But I see I see a path for them to get to that twenty billion in revenue and beyond um, over the course of the next you know decade. And that's and that's even in the face of of the threat to revlimid. 
Absolutely. And uh, the company has been raising their full year guidance every quarter. Right now, they're, they just raised it for in Q3 to $15.2 billion, up from 14.8 at the start of the year. Um, so, growth is definitely happening. Don't write off Celgene uh, because of where the stock is trading. It has lots of, of shots on goal here. And right now, it's literally trading at its all-time lows. So, if there was ever a time to get in on this stock, I would say that time is now. Second motion. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I you know, listen, you're never going to pick the bottom, right? And there's a difference in my view. There's a difference between catching a falling knife, okay, which is going out and buying shares in a company that it, that has fallen on tough times. The shares continue to fall, fall, fall. If the company is not working on disruptive things, if their sales are falling, if their profit is falling, then yeah. Okay, wait until it bottoms. Wait until it settles out. Don't try and catch that falling knife. But that's not the case with Celgene. You know, they're still growing their top line. They're still growing their bottom line, and they've got all these, as you put it, shots on goal. Absolutely. So, hopefully, in uh, this week's episode of Industry Focus, we've brought to you a good mix of different types of stocks that present really compelling buying opportunities. Certainly, keep your eyes out for more opportunities moving forward, and more importantly, keep your emotions in check. Now is the time to buy, not time to sell. Um, and that is it for this week's Industry Focus Healthcare Show. As always, people on the program may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and the Motley Fool may have four formal recommendations for or against, so don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. This show is produced by Dan Boyd. For Todd Campbell, I'm Shannon Jones. Thanks for listening and full on. Full on.